Hello again, everybody. I'm Ken Boxer, and this is Ken Boxer Live. We have a fantastic show this half hour. Joining us is my very special guest, Mr. John Palminteri. Now, you know him from radio and television, KEYT, the senior news reporter. He's been in the broadcast industry for almost 30, or probably over 30 years. He's here in our studio live, and we're going to be discussing so many things. He just has a wealth <laughs> of information of things. So without further ado, welcome to our show, Ken Boxer Live. <laughs> It's a pleasure to be here because I, I can recall when, when the young Ken Boxer was live. Oh, God. The <laughs> your previous show. Welcome back yourself. Around the town I should live. be interviewing you and no, about no, no, your no, no. return to broadcasting. John, it's so much fun. You know, years ago, I, I did it for 18 years. And if you can believe it, you've been in for over 30, as I said. But after a while, I just said, you know, I'm going to try something else. Restaurant got too busy, so. But you, let's talk about you, though. Thirty years in the business, you started in the radio. way you talk. It's as if we're both ninety years old. <laughs> we both got gray. Look at this. You, when you started, yes. you did not have gray hair. In fact, we have clips to prove oh, it. Where did you find those? Well, uh, yeah, I started here um, in my young twenties, only in radio, uh, in 1981, and uh, we were armed with a, a cassette recorder and a microphone. Those were our tools of our trade back then. The that microphone worked. was the cassette tape, right? Yeah, just, just that's what we walked around with and did our interviews with. And I mean, it, uh, it has been such a quantum leap to where we are today. But um, I started back there in the news press building in a radio station, 1250 KTMS. Back then it was owned by the news press. And around the mid 80s, it, it no longer was. And that, that was my first job as a news director with a young, aggressive team of of uh, reporters all walking around with tape recorders and microphones interviewing everything that moved. Yes. But that, Pat, you still have the smile, that beautiful smile. You've still been able to I'm excited about here. what I do. So I, I do wake up happy and, and not every day is, a, is the, you know, a, a, a thrilling day because of some of the nature of the news business. It can, can get very sad and some of it can be, you know, a fiesta party and some of it can be a car crash. So, you know, you have to be able to balance that way. And you do it. I don't know. You, after a while, don't you just kind of say, God, another news story. What am I going to do? How am I going to do this? I'm just, I've, how many car crashes can you do? <laughs> well, you don't look at it about how many you do. It's about who you're serving and that the audience deserves to know the news of the day. And, and sometimes it's in their neighborhood and sometimes it's a broad spectrum news story, but it doesn't minimize the fact that they should know what's going on. And I believe they should know what's going on, even though they think they should maybe be watching a reality show instead of this show or the news show, I think they ought to be watching the news. I think they ought to be reading a newspaper. I think they ought to be listening to local radio. But you, let's say, in the morning, you're waking up, you've got, what, how many things with the news? I mean, you're all news. I mean, you're, you're yeah. delivering the news on what channel, what so, station? So I, fortunately, with the modern technology, I can do news from home on the radio. So I'm a contributor to KCLU, the National Public Radio Station in this area. And it's an awesome station with a great team. Jim Rondo, Lance Orozco, Dave Meyer is on there. Willis Sandmeyer is doing work, and she is formerly of uh, KTLA Los Angeles and KYT. I also work uh, for six newscasts a morning on KJEE, which is the modern rock station, a little edgier, a little more hip. And then I uh, take everything I've been sort of studying all morning and take it over to KYT and put in a, a good day's work there and as well. And that's like five days a week. Minimum. Minimum. And then you're also, <laughs> what you have your, we used to have pagers, now you have your cell phone with you. You're always on call, I imagine, right? I'm ready. I mean, we're, some of the frontline people are generally ready with either gear or some type of, you know, equipment with them or safety gear. We have fire gear with us at all time in case we need to go. And Yeah, I'm ready to go. What's the toughest news story for you? Oh, I would say one of these long haul city or county meetings that go <laughs> three or four hours and you have to boil it down to... Two uh, minutes or 90 seconds. That sometimes can be difficult. Hey, the phone's ringing. Wait a second. Who could it be? Who would dare Hello? interrupt this show? Who would inter Hello? Oh my God, it's the mayor again. No. It is. No time for this. <laughs> is this <laughs> Mayor Mayor Helene? Helene Schneider? No. Well, you, you called last week. Uh huh. No, you can't be on the show. 
John Palmentary, the famous senior news reporter for KUIT, is is here, and you've just interrupted the. Sh you've, you're interrupting. Uh huh. You look again. Last week I told you that we are hurting with our ratings. That's why we have John here because we want to boost our ratings. No, you. No, I'm going to hang up. No, I, no. Bye. Can you believe that? You should have told her that sometimes I'm referred to as the night mayor. I'll, I'll vote for you. I'm out late at night uh, uh, monitoring things in the city. Well, when you're, you know, when there's a, an election, you're, you're the oh, go-to guy. Oh, you can't guy. be on. Well, no, when you have an election, you have to be careful about putting, playing favorites oh, with who so you I put on the air. Her. Yes. Well, you're always the go-to person, right? You've done how many elections? I mean, you've seen. Uh, yeah, I've been at every election since November of 1981. And you know, all the way back to when uh, uh, Jerry DeWitt uh, beat, uh, beat out, uh, I believe it was Ed Foley, Ed Foley by 16 votes for a city council seat. Well, you know, and then he ended up having a, a very long tenure uh, on the council. You know, I, and you know, he, he never ran for mayor, did he? No. Neither so, of them did. Neither. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, I've got, I've got to show you something. When, ladies and gentlemen, if you were to type in and Google John Palmentary. This is what you would get. One of the things. One of the things. Now tell me, John, what are we seeing here? This is well, this is the Palmentary is prime time sticker, and this came out of a, a fan base that I was not aware of, and it's since had had some horsepower. It's not too organized these days, but about five or six years ago, maybe longer. Uh, uh, I would say sticker art. They're called sticker art people. I mean, made I've, an illustration of my face based on the picture on our <laughs> website, and then made a sticker out of it. And, and it was all over town. Yeah, it was I'm kind of a Ron Burgundy spoof. Oh, okay. And, it, and I, I it took me a while to find out who did it, and they're really good kids, very talented. <laughs> but as I've told people many times, it's not just around town. They have now since gone out of their way to put them up as far away as Vietnam in the front of scooters. In yeah. FedEx planes at 3,500, <laughs> 35,000 you know, feet, my, and on and on and on. My wife has said she's actually was she was jogging along shoreline, and she actually saw a bicycle with your picture on the bicycle seat. <laughs> I know that bike. <laughs> well, it's you know, and I'm smiling in the illustration. So I tell people if they still have the stickers around, that no matter what kind of day you're having, that I'm always going to smile at you. Well, when you st oh, that's nice. When, when you started in the business, you started with radio, and then you went to television. You said you don't, you didn't have internet. You didn't have the ability to go look up a story as quickly as you can. So when you news was breaking news, KYT, do they break into the the station if there's something that tantamount? Yeah. Well, to kind of compare all that, you know, in, in short. You know, yes, we, back then we actually used a phone book to look up a number <laughs> right. or anything, a government service or the Congress person's office and, and to contact someone, we'd use the phone book, which I know is a controversial item these days because people believe if you have a phone book, you've killed a tree, but <laughs> that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> that's another story. It was a very useful tool at one time and some people still love them. And some people are still faster with them than on their phones. Um, but everybody would would break in, and, and but the, but the real story back then on the real beginnings of you know back in the 80s back then is that radio almost I would say six or eight stations in this town had their own news department. So when you went to a press conference, you had the TVs cameras there, two or three of them, and you had maybe five other hands out there with microphones with mics. Right, right. Mm -hmm. But since then, with radio consolidation and job losses and some other things, less people doing news, we have. You know, zero radio microphones out there now. Once in a while, see see one uh, KCLU will come come up and put a mic out, and just TV. It's very it, the uh, the politicians don't have that array of cameras on them anymore. Now you've been in the business long enough now. So when you call a particular, let's say, politician, do they take the call quickly? I would say most of the time they either take <laughs> it or return it. They do. Okay. Yeah. And they've learned over the years about the deadlines. And also what happens if they don't comment or don't appear. We will go on the air and say that they did not make themselves available. All right. well, and most do a good job of making themselves available. Well, you made available to us a, an award. We have a couple. I want to just kind of showcase this first one. They don't just, ladies and gentlemen, they just don't hand these out. They, you earn this. This is what? This is a golden mic. 
Um, it's uh, put out by the Radio Television News Directors Association. And I know you wanted to see what some of these honors are. And over the years, we've been very fortunate to be at the scene of of big stories. I think this one is uh, the Gap Fire. So it's a real recent one. Um, some of them go back to the Painted Cave Fire, which, and that was in 1990. And they award in different categories for you know our, your outstanding news coverage in different categories, and it could go up from everything from life coverage to sports coverage to writing to this type of thing. And this is a heavier one. Yes. That's like a golden mic, and this is an Associated Press uh, Mark Twain Award for the T-Fire. This one was with KCLU, so it has my name on it and my colleagues Lance Rosco and Jim Rondo. And I, and I want your audience to see the uh, profile of that, if you turn it sideways. Get a nice that. close up. Is that my see director? That? Or maybe I should help Let's here. See. Let's Which see. Which camera? Well, Let's see if it is. Well, see. we're going to put it on this camera. This right camera? Here. No, it's going to be this camera right you here. Go to this camera. Yeah, we're going to eventually Whatever get to is. this camera. This is not me. <laughs> there we go. But it's Mark Twain. <laughs> okay. But a lot of people <laughs> said it looks like they might have molded it there, and I, well, I laughed too. Well, and what a, what a great honor because it's Mark Twain. Well, first off, congratulations. Great mustache and full head of hair. Congratulations, and a great you know, journalist. Uh, and you are, and you, we're gonna, and people are gonna see it if they. Uh, everyone has seen your work, but just in case, the few people that haven't, and those that have, would like to see it again. We have a clip, a few clips. But can you lead us into this first clip? Uh, the one I believe we're gonna see is from 1990, June 27th, uh, 1990 at 6:02 p.m. To be specific, the Painted Cave fire started in 75 mile an hour down canyon winds about halfway up the pass and uh, it was a uh, it was a uh, hundred degrees and it had been for several days very weird weather and a, a fire started and started heading right towards homes we had about that much time to get up there and start reporting and it was vicious okay let's watch it this one is a, this is about two hours into the fire two okay. or three hours in let's watch we are going to go to john paul and terry Near El Sueño Road in Cayo Real, this area had expensive big homes, and behind me you see uh, the last two that were standing fully engulfed in flames. This area was the last to go right next to the county jail area. People were fighting the fires with firemen, with the fire hoses, with their hoses, with shovels. They were screaming frantically. They were driving in a paddock. We were in there with them earlier, and the fire was spreading so fast, the folks in this area really had very little chance to protect their structures or get out. Throughout the evening, that has been the story that we have seen. Many people trying frantically to save what they could, but barely even getting a shot at putting out the fire near their homes with their garden homes or whatever. Resources on this fire have been so spread out, many people complained that they did not see firefighters or those to help them evacuate, but the resources were going all over this part of the south coast to chase the fire down and get ahead of it. Many people were able to get out with belongings, their dogs, their cats, their loved ones as well. But throughout the evening and in, in the evacuation areas we have visited, there have been frantic stories asking us, the reporters, those of us who have been in the area, well, have you been on my street? Did you see my house? Where is it burning now? So many unanswered questions, so many structures that have been burned. Santa Barbara County probably will be seeing by morning the worst fire it has seen since the 1977 Sycamore Canyon fire. In that fire, for those of you that recall, 200 homes burned in the overnight in an eight-hour period, much the same way this did. It did $26 million damage in that overnight fire. Certainly, this will do much more. This area of Cairo and El Sueño is virtually gone, but we are still hearing explosions from what we think are vehicles, uh, giant eucalyptus trees, and the area like that. Darkness is setting in, and many people are very, very confused as to what is going on in their streets. You're watching Ken Boxer live with our very special guest, John Palmentary. John, watching that, you're right on the line. Yeah, we took a, a, a real beating that night because it was, a, it was a horrific night where we lost 600 structures roughly. And uh, to, to witness that, you know, at some point as a young reporter, some aspects of news can get the adrenaline going and be exciting. But as, as you see so much loss, it was just horrifying to see that. We lost a life in that too, Andrea Gurka. Uh, could not outrun the flames. So I'll never forget that. And you don't forget those. I mean, there's so many aspects and dynamics of, of you know, and people evacuating with panic and that type of thing. But our story, our job is to get there and be able to, to condense that and to be able to directly help people either evacuate or know what's going on. And we have to get there and do that. And we don't uh, do it from five miles away. We, we go in. I have a very 
talented, aggressive camera crew uh, to this day that will go in there safely and get the story. And, uh, and, and you know, in some cases, we actually are helping people on the spot. But uh, that night, we'll never forget. And being on the front line, I mean, your life is in peril, is it not? Yes, we try and make sure we have a safety escape, but uh, coming down the pass that night, we started up towards the start of the fire and it went down in a canyon. And as we were trying to get out, it was coming back up a canyon. And we, we stopped and we went and we went through some fire and you don't want to do that, uh, but Didn't, it was dangerous. And KTYT went through, I mean, they, um, they were on the air continually. Yes. Right? And you know, to move it forward in the recent uh, uh, T fire was a fire that started at 5.45 p.m. Uh, in November of a few years back and so we were able to see that from TV Hill and be able to put a camera right on the first flicker of flames and hear the call outs and we went live at six o'clock and never stopped for what a day straight. Yeah but do you have easy access does the fire department give you and the police department give you that? No and I don't mean to not give us easy access but there's a lot of dynamics going on of people evacuating and fire crews trying to go in so we have to be appropriate and kind of throttle our how we do what we do, and we certainly are trying to make sure we have a way out. Yeah, and, and Santa Barbara's had their share of fires, right. earthquakes, floods. You cover the story any differently with all three types of disasters? Uh, most of the time you want to make sure you can get to where the exact you know, action is. With a fire, it spreads out pretty fast, so you have a lot of different dynamics. Uh, flooding, you certainly don't want to be in the wrong place in a flood. You can get your car stuck and you can get yourself in deep trouble, no pun intended. So you want to, you know, be mindful of what's coming and what's going to happen. I'm, I'm not real thrilled to be in, I've been on the San Marcos Pass where mud has come down and a highway patrol unit in front of us, we thought if we stay behind that, we'd be safe and we were both sliding to the left while, while going forward and the, the left didn't give us much room. Well, I want to set up this picture. It's a picture that you may or may not have seen, but um, I'm going to have my director set it up right now. In fact, you don't know what picture is going to come in. I'm going to surprise you because you were on you were on the front lines of a fire. Okay, but you I thought it was my baby picture. <laughs> Normally, but the, we also yes. have you on the front. I was lines. a young baby with a mustache. I, well, <laughs> you were very young in that picture. Very young. Okay. Uh, I, want, I was ask, going to ask you if you would have done anything differently today knowing what you know now, what you did then, because you're, obviously you're more seasoned now. What would, you, would you be doing anything differently in how you would cover the story? Probably not. Yeah. I'd, I'd be, we're, we're very aggressive about going in to as far as we can and just get a hold of the people that are, are affected and then but just making sure we get out safely. And we also have to get to a spot we can broadcast from. Sometimes, you know, the terrain doesn't allow us to broadcast. T technology sure. is helping us more these days to be able to broadcast um, from almost anywhere. But back then, you had to really get a spot where you could transmit. Okay, let me see if we can okay. get this picture up. Can we? I'm asking my floor director. Yes, okay, let's, John, look at the monitor now and the people, oh, look at this. This was a very <laughs> tough assignment from just a few days ago. Uh huh. We were uh, profiling a local Voxer. Uh, Not me. At Chumash. <laughs> Not me. And uh, while, when I arrived, the ring girls just happened to arrive as well, so I posed with the ring You've girls. You've got a lot of explaining to do, John. The, or, the, uh, <laughs> the person who coordinates the ring girls is a friend of mine. Ah, and I, didn't, I have okay. not seen him in a long time. He goes, so do you want a picture with them? I said, of course. Well, our friend, former CNN news anchor Bella Shaw, said you must have been tickled in pink. <laughs> I love that. They were, they were very nice. Now, that's the front line I would like yes. to be on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. so there's another clip that you brought with you. Um, if you can set us up on what we're going to see. This then. was just recently. This was the white fire, and to get right to it, we happened to get to a spot with the uh, help and coordination of uh, the camera crew that night, my uh, cameraman Oscar Flores. We were able to get down a trail right next to the San Ynez River, which is normally dry, but had a pond of water, which they were drawing water from. And with our new technology, we were able to get just uh, within a few feet of where the water was, and it was a spectacular opportunity. And that's what you're going to see. Okay. Do we have it set up? Okay. Let's see. We want to go back to our senior reporter, John Palminteri, live next to the San Inez River. John? 
And we're here along the Santa Inez River, as you say, and this is the area of White Rock. We've been here all afternoon, and I want to give you a different perspective as we've been able to move a little bit closer without any choppers coming through this area of the water source they have found. You know, I think if we can just pan over to this side, you'll just see just how much this is just a pool of water. And the helicopters were able to see this source of water so close to this fire, and it was large enough to get a chopper in here. There's some other pools of water, but they're very small. And uh, this is really helping them get hundreds of gallons of water sucked up into the helicopter and up over the ridge above me and into the fire zone right away. They're just doing loops around here and doing quick pit stops of 45, 60 seconds. Some of them have the snouts that go in the water and some have buckets. As a matter of fact, another chopper is coming in right now, and this looks like this is going to be one of the fire choppers that has a hose line down. Coming in right over our broadcast position, this helicopter is now going to drop down to the top of the San Andreas Vis River, and the helicopter is now sucking up the water and throwing a lot of wind and some of the spray off of this pool of water, but it's such a valuable resource for the firefighters, and it'll park there, as you see, just a few feet off of the body of water for what's going to be here about 45 or 60 seconds and then fill up. It's a dramatic shot, but you can just see how precise the pilots are to be able to come in and just sit right there. They're watching all their meters. They're filling up, and this one is ready to go now with the full load. Oh, it's a heavy helicopter load now, and it's going to go up and over the ridge and start attacking the fire. And we have seen two or three of these in a row along with a sky crane helicopter. Our lens is probably quite spotted right now from that spray we got from this location, but this is exactly what they need in a fire like this, to be able to turn loops as fast as they possibly can and keep dropping water on it, in addition to all the ground forces, and when they have the ability, the air attack. We'll keep our fingers crossed tonight that we do not get those big gusts of winds that could spread this fire into a, a much larger footprint. That's the very latest from the edge of the San Inez River, the source where they're getting the water to attack the white fire. I'm John Paul and Terry, News Channel 3. And welcome back. You're watching Ken Boxer Live with our special guest, Mr. John Palmentary. John, wa just watching that footage, you're in the trenches. You're right there. We got unusually close uh, there uh, to the helicopter sucking up the water for this fire. And the new technology allowed us to get there. And with our new owners, we have more uh, technology than we've ever had before to bring news to the public. Well, talk about that, KYT. What's going on with the future Last there? November, we were uh, purchased by an organization that has uh, a number of TV stations that run very successfully across the country. They're known as News, Press, and Gazette, and they're out of St. Joseph, Missouri. And they were very excited to buy Channel 3, and, and who wouldn't? <laughs> it's and it's not market. just because of the location, but there's a lot of potential, and it's really a landmark station on the Central Coast. It's been around 60 years and, uh, and they are very excited about uh, buying it and upgrading it because, uh, you know, in recent years there's been a lot of new technology that hasn't uh, been purchased, and now it is. We have gone high definition. We have a very exciting looking set. Um, anybody who has a, a, a flat screen TV with the new technology at home gets a spectacular picture. We put money into transmitters up in the Santa Maria and San Luis Obispo area, which is in our coverage area. And things uh, that maybe weren't working so, so sharply before are sharp now. And that's just the beginning. Well, you know, K, um, KYT is so lucky to have you. Trust me on that, because <laughs> here you are, you're so excited about these things. And you've been in the business for a third of KYT's life. You just said 60 years, and you've been at least 20, I think, at KYT, right? You're, you're not so, the only one that's <laughs> reminding me of this now. <laughs> okay. Um, in these years at KYT and covering uh, with KTMS and, and the like, What's been more, the most fun? I mean, Reagan years, perhaps? I would say the Reagan years. And for those who don't remember, when we were in the 80s, we had the opportunity to, to as local reporters, to be welcomed into the White House press corps when they were here during the summer vacations. And, and even though the president was up at Rancho del Cielo, there would be White House briefings in Santa Barbara that we got to go to. And our eyes were this big. And our, our little microphones were out interviewing people. And we got to meet Sam Donaldson and Helen Benson Thomas and Bill Plant and Chris Wallace, and, and it goes on and on wow. from there. Right. And, um, and then, of course, during some of those trips, the president himself would have a barbecue. 
a summer barbecue for the press. And to uh, see Sam Donaldson and the president in cowboy gear, you know, talking off the cuff. And it was to, amazing times, yes. weren't they? And it was, everything was off the record. I mean, nothing came out of there that was published. Not that anything, uh, you know, it was just small talk, but it was just an opportunity to meet the president and Mrs. Reagan. And, and over the years, you know, I've met President Ford, President Carter here, uh, uh, President Bush when he was vice president, uh, President Clinton a Didn't couple meet, times. And Desmond Tutu, weren't you? At he was here, but I wasn't assigned to that story. Okay, but a lot King of Harris people got that story. Uh, okay. <laughs> a lot of people have. Yeah. You know, um, and so we've had these great opportunities to meet. Exactly. And, and, uh, and Santa Barbara is such a sophisticated community and a dot on the map that they all are come here and more are coming. And reporters who work here get some extraordinary opportunities. Well, I have an opportunity uh, to promote a friend of ours, both of us, for the San Barbara Film Festival. You know Carol Marshall? Yes. She has, she was telling me to promote And the promote film festival this. brings world class people. Exactly. Here. The film yeah. festival, actually, if you want to. Um, uh, support the film festival's children's educational and community outreach program. Uh, they are having on August 25th a, um, a fundraiser at the Arlington. We have a picture of that? There we go. And the fundraiser is on, as I said, the 25th of, let's see if August, Sunday, the Mark of Zorro, $5, Douglas Fairbanks at the Arlington. Not Douglas Fairbanks, he's no yeah. longer there. But the movie is with a pipe organ accompaniment, but then following is a costume party, a masquerade party. And that's a, uh, so it's a silent movie with the pipe organ that they have, uh, a lot of people don't know, is buried, buried the in the do. Arlington. Yeah, that's the thing. You know, time goes by so quickly, John. I'm, you're very busy, as I said. The city of Santa Barbara is lucky to have you. We're very fortunate, lucky My to have you. My apologies to the mayor who couldn't be on tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. I can come back any other time to fill in all the gaps between roughly 85 and 2012. Uh, <laughs> Whatever we missed in there. You know, well, before we go, I just also have another question to ask you. What, do you ever see yourself doing anything besides news? And if, it, if you could just think of something, what would it have been? I've always wanted to host this community show where I'd sit at a table with a, a microphone and have have noted guests come in on the other side. <laughs> you know, this is so much fun to be here and getting to see you again. You're my friend, welcome, and I'm so glad that you were here. I'm glad to, to be part of the show. I'm gonna tell everyone to watch this and every other show you do with all your other guests. Thank you so and much. And I know you'll be able to bring all the, the really, the famous people of Santa Barbara, the, uh, the movers and the shakers. And you're part of it. Thank you so much. I'm and, a shaker. <laughs> and a mover. <laughs> all right, and that's it. Another show we Thank have. You. I'm Ken Boxer. This is Ken Boxer Live. We hope you enjoyed this show. We will be with you coming in uh, next week as well. So, good night, everybody.